Chapter 23 I regained consciousness staring up at the sky. Something jerked and shook my body. I turned and recognized Sasai and Nakajima. The two officers had climbed onto the Zero's wing and carried me down from the plane. Nishizawa's voice burst through the murmuring of the crowd which had gathered. Call a car, quick! he shouted. He raged at the orderlies. Quick! To the operating room! Go phone the chief surgeon! Quickly, you slow son of a bitch! I couldn't go to the hospital. Not yet. I must report to Captain Saito before anything else. We always reported to the command post. The need to turn in my report for the day clamoured urgently in my mind. I raised my right arm, protesting to Sasai and Nakajima to put me down. I have to report, I choked. Let me go to the command post. Damn your duty, Nakajima thundered back at me. That can wait. We're taking you to the hospital. I insisted and yelled that I had to turn in my report. The next moment, Nishizawa stepped forward and grabbed me under the arm. Ota slipped along my left side, and the two pilots carried me into the command post. Nishizawa kept muttering, Stupid bastard! Doesn't even know what he looks like! Crazy! That's what he is! I hardly recall standing, trying to stand, before Captain Saito, who stared at me incredulously. I think I spoke to him, but everything began to black out again. All of a sudden, I wanted to go to sleep. That was it. Sleep. What was I doing here, anyway? Then there was only blackness. Nishizawa and Ota carried me to the car. They told me later, waiting outside the command post. Nishizawa hurled the driver from the seat and slid behind the wheel, driving fast, but carefully to avoid any bad bumps for the hospital. Sasai and Ota stayed with me in the back seat, supporting me. The chief surgeon was waiting for me in the operating room. He cut off my torn uniform and at once began to work on my wounds. Through my sleep, I felt blinding stabs of pain from time to time as the doctor cut into my scalp. He saved two jagged pieces of 50 caliber bullets to show me later. I felt a knife blade scraping against my skull. I awoke almost as he finished. I stared up at him as he bent over me. My eyes. I remembered my eyes. Suddenly panic gripped me. My eyes, I shouted. Doctor, what about my eyes? You are seriously wounded, he replied. I can do nothing further for you here. He peered at my face closely. You'll have to be sent back to Japan, where a specialist can work on you. A feeling of disaster engulfed me. I feared for my right eye. I could see nothing on that side. The thought of being blinded horrified me. I would be useless as a fighter pilot. But I had to fly. I had to fly fighters again. Four days passed slowly in the hospital. Bandages covered my body. The doctor withdrew four pieces of metal stuck in my flesh, as well as steel splinters from my cheeks. On the fourth day, I felt slight movement in my left hand and leg. The muscles barely twitched, but at least they moved. On the other hand, the head wound began to rot in the high tropical humidity, and my right eye remained blind. Meanwhile, the fighter sweeps and bombing raids against Guadalcanal continued without let-up. Every day I heard the thunder of the planes as they raced down the runways and took off for the distant battlefield. Rabol had its own daily visitors, the high-flying fortresses, which attacked the two airfields. Every time the enemy bombers approached, I was carried to a shelter with the other patients. Each evening, Sasai and Nakajima visited me. They suggested that I return to Japan. Only the temperate climate of the home islands and a leading specialist could cure my eye injuries, they said. I refused to go home. I was irrational and irritable. I insisted I could be cured right here at Rabol, that there was no reason why I couldn't be flying again in a few weeks, if I had only known. It is difficult to explain my feelings, my reluctance to leave the hellhole that was Rabaul. I realize now that I boarded on the hysterical from the nightmare prospect of having to end my career as a pilot. There was the matter of honor as well. I felt I was honor bound to remain at Rabaul as long as I could. Even if I could not fly, I could help the green pilots. I might be able to warn them of the mistakes which could cause their death. All the reasons melted into one. My return to Japan meant a final judgment by an eye specialist, and I feared and rebelled against what I might be told. Sasai and Nakajima abandoned their arguments.
The matter was ended on the morning of August 11th, when Captain Saito, the commander of the Lei Wing, came to my bedside. He was as kind to me as he could possibly be, and equally adamant. I know how you feel, Sakai, he said, but I have taken all factors into consideration. My orders are that you will be sent home to Japan on rotation, and assigned to the Yokosuka Naval Hospital. You will leave tomorrow by transport plane. The surgeon has told me that your only hope lies with the doctors at Yokosuka. He smiled at me. Your going home will do as much for us as it will for you, Sakai. We will all know that the best medical care in Japan will be yours. He rose to his feet. For several moments he looked at me, then leaned down and placed his hand on my shoulder. You have done a marvellous job for all of us, Saburo, he said softly. Every man who has ever flown with you is proud to have known and to have fought with you. When your wounds are healed, come back to us. Then he walked away. That evening Sasai came to visit me. He was visibly tired from the day's mission over Guadalcanal. I told him of the orders sending me home the next day. In a little while, all my old friends had assembled in the room for a modest farewell party. No one sang, or talked loudly, or cracked any jokes. We merely talked quietly, mostly about Japan. But the Americans had other ideas about our small gathering. What had turned out to be a quiet few hours ended up in a mad dash for the shelters, the other pilots carrying me out of the hospital. I gritted my teeth with shame and bitterness. I felt so helpless. Here were the same men whom I had led into combat, and now they were carrying me around like a half-blind, crippled child. I wanted to scream and shout and tear the bandages off my body. But all I could do was to lie there with my eyes tightly closed. Early the next morning I limped slowly to the pier. A barge waited to take me to the flying boat anchored on the water. Sasai held my hands tightly in his own. I'm going to miss you, Saburo. Much more than you will ever know. Tears started down my cheeks. I could not hold them back. I choked up and could only hold his hands. Sasai withdrew his hands, unbuckled his belt, and handed it to me. I stared at the famed engraved Roaring Tiger. Saburo, this belt was given to me by my father, one for myself and one each for my two brothers-in-law. One of us has already died. I know little of the magic qualities of the Silver Tiger, but I wish you to keep this buckle and wear it for me. I hope it will help to bring you back here to us. I protested, but to no avail. Sasai would not have it otherwise. He placed the buckle and belt in my pocket, then clasped my hands again. I'll see you again, Saburo. Don't say farewell. We shall meet again, and soon, I hope. He helped me into the barge. In a moment, it was chugging toward the waiting plane. Nishizawa, Ota, Yonikawa, Hattori, Nakajima and all my friends waved from the pier. They were shouting for me to hurry back, to fly with them again. In a few moments they were blurred. I could still see only a few feet with my left eye. I stood as straight as I could on the barge, my right hand raised, as they blurred into dim and unrecognisable forms. Then I cried like a child. There were few passengers in the flying boat myself, an orderly assigned to take care of me on the return trip home, and several war correspondents. We stopped at Truk and Saipan to refuel. It was a long time since I'd walked on my home soil. I had no idea of what conditions would be like back in Japan, but I was totally unprepared for the shock of Yokohama. We landed in the Yokohama harbour early Saturday evening. There was little purpose in reporting that night to the hospital, and I went into the city, where I could take a taxi cab to my uncle's house in western Tokyo. These people, they had absolutely no idea of what the war really was like. I gaped in astonishment at the bustling crowds, at the bright signs and lights. I could not believe the sounds which met my ears, of thousands of voices, of laughter and unconcern. Didn't they know what was really going on down in the southwest Pacific? At every newscast, blaring loudly into the streets, the radios boomed forth with the warship march broadcasting details of tremendous victories against the Americans in the sea battles which raged off the Solomons. I heard nothing but incredible lists of American shipping destroyed, of hundreds of airplanes shot down, and the crowds of people in their light and colourful summer clothes 
stopped outside the stores and the corners where the radios trumpeted. Every time the announcer mentioned another major defeat over the enemy, loud cheers and cries resounded through the streets. The nation was drunk on false victories. It was hard to believe that a destructive war was going on. In the stores I saw that only certain commodities were being rationed, but that the daily necessities of life were available in abundance. I wanted to get out of the city, and quickly. Everything at Leh and Rabul seemed so unreal. Could these two separate worlds exist simultaneously? The blood and dying only short hours away by airplane, and the cheering for non-existent victories here at home. I wafted down a cab and gave him my uncle's address. We passed through Yokohama and entered Tokyo. Several minutes later, a policeman halted the vehicle and stared through the window at me. My uniform was blood-stained and I was still swathed in bandages. What happened to you? he demanded. I've just returned to Japan from the front, I answered sourly. So, he cried, so you were hurt at the battlefront. Where? Tell me, and how? I'm a pilot, I spat, at Guadalcanal. I was shot up in a fight. Guadalcanal, the young policeman's eyes gleamed. We hear a lot about that nowadays. I understand that only yesterday we had a smashing victory over the Americans. The radio said that our navy sank five cruisers, ten transports, and ten destroyers. It certainly must have been an exciting spectacle to watch. That was too much. I'm sorry, Sergeant, I snapped at him, but I'm late, I shouted at the driver. Go ahead, at once. Many years had gone by since the first time I had walked into my uncle's home. The house stood unchanged, a link to an era which now seemed a million years in the past. For several minutes I stood on the sidewalk, taking in the familiar structure, the lights, the sounds. A strange feeling of peace descended upon me. My irritation fled, and I opened the door, exactly as I had done in my childhood, and, using the same words I had always cried upon entering the house, shouted, Here I am! I'm home! A startled, Who's that? came from the kitchen. I grinned. It was my aunt. It's me! I called back. There was silence for a moment. It's me, Saburo! I shouted in joy. My uncle's voice burst through the house, a startled, What? Then they came running out to the portico. For almost a full minute they stared at me. My uncle, my aunt, and my two cousins Hatsuyo and Michio, unable to speak, stood with their mouths open in astonishment. I returned their gaze patiently as their eyes took in my blood-stained uniform and the bandages. My uncle's voice was a querulous whisper. It really is you, Saburo? I could barely hear his words. It is Saburo? It is not a ghost I am seeing? He strained forward, afraid that I might vanish into thin air. No, it is no ghost, I answered. It is really I. I'm home once again. This was like returning to life. The battles, the dying, the wounds, squeezing the trigger, flicking in rolls to escape pursuing fighters, cowering in the mud of the bomb shelters. All of it fled. All of it became unreal remote, a shadowy world which never existed, but which hung over my shoulder like the ghost my uncle had believed me to be. To sit in a home like this again, to talk with my uncle and aunt, to see Hatsuyo and Michio again, to relax, to know there would be no bombs tonight, no fortresses cruising high above 20,000 feet, no Mitchells and marauders screaming in, no blasting explosions or shrieking fragments of steel or fiery traces into the billets. It took a long time to relax as the evening wore on. Every now and then I shook my head in amazed happiness over it all. We had so many things to talk about. It was almost three years since I had spent a night with this family. Hatsuyo was no longer the high school girl I remembered. I stared at her, trying to realize that this beautiful young woman really was my same cousin. Even Michio, a wild boy in the lower grades when I had gone to high school, was a husky young man. I kept staring at Hatsuyo trying to catch up with all the years which had passed so strangely, and, now that I was seeing them again, so quickly, I stayed the night at their home. It was the first night in many years that I had enjoyed a deep and sound sleep. Not even my wounds, which had kept me awake for the last week, 
disturbed me. The next morning I left by train for Yokosuka. The everyday life of the people in the city seemed even more startling than the night before. The passengers, especially the young girls and women, looked at me only once. They grimaced at my appearance and looked the other way. Their deliberate concentration to avoid looking at the bloody bandages unnerved and enraged me. No longer was I the leading ace of Lei and Rabul, the man whom Captain Saito asked to come back, the pilot who cried with his other flyers. I was a bloody, dirty, and, yes, it was true, a distasteful sight to my own people. I was disgusted. No sooner had I reported to the Yokosuka hospital than an orderly took me to the chief surgeon's room. I was puzzled. Today was Sunday. Except for dire emergencies, the chief surgeon would not be on duty. He surprised me by greeting me personally. He smiled at my astonishment. I left word that I was to be notified the moment you showed up, he explained. I've just come from my billet. You see, I received a special letter from Captain Saito of your lay wing, requesting me to do everything possible for you. He looked at me for a moment. Captain Saito went to great pains to tell me of what you have done in the Pacific. I understand that you are the leading fighter ace of all our pilots, I nodded. I can well understand your captain's apprehension then. Come, he took my arm. We will begin work on you at once. For a month, I was confined to my hospital bed. I was steeped in misery. Life meant little to me. I dreamed during the day and night of that long flight back to Rabul, of all the occasions when I could have shoved the stick forward and plunged into the ocean. It would have been only a brief moment of pain. Dr. Sakano visited me often to study my eyes. I did everything I could, he told me, but your right eye will never recover, not fully. You will be able to see things perhaps one or two feet in front of you, but that is all. Your left eye will be perfectly all right. His words were a thundering sentence of death, of living death, to me. A fighter pilot, with only one eye. I laughed bitterly, and the doctor went away. My head wound healed rapidly, and the doctor permitted me to walk around the hospital. Every week I put in an application to be discharged and sent back to Rabal, and every week the application was rejected. Finally, the chief surgeon personally returned the latest application. He was obviously angry. I tell you, Sakai, he complained, it will be many months before you can even think of returning to Rabal. My orders are explicit. You are to have at least six months convalescence before you can be assigned to any duty, here at home or overseas. I felt like a fugitive, a deserter from the battlefront. I thought of all the pilots, of Nishizawa and Ota and Sasai, going out every day in their zeros to engage in battle. I was afraid even to listen to the war news over the radio. It reminded me too much of Rabaul. One day I had visitors. A nurse came into my room. There are visitors downstairs, she said. Would you like to have them come to your room? I had no idea who they could be. It was Thursday, and my cousin Hatsuyo came to see me, bringing flowers for my room, each weekend, when she could get away from her job in the munitions factory. I had written my mother not to attempt the long trip from Kyushu, for within the next several weeks I would be transferred to the Sasebo Hospital. Yokosuka was more than 700 miles by rail from Fukuoka in northern Kyushu, where my mother had moved to live with her daughter and son-in-law, but I had not expected these visitors. Two people entered the room. I strained to see them. My eye still was unable to make out faces at a distance of more than six or seven feet. Fujiko-san! I gasped her name. Fujiko, even more beautiful than I had remembered her, stood in the doorway with her father, Professor Niori. I had not seen her since our one meeting more than 18 months before in Osaka. They bowed to me, and I returned the greeting. Still we had not spoken, except for my crying out her name. The nurse offered them chairs and withdrew. Her father spoke. Hatsuyo-san wrote us that you were at this hospital. How we have worried about you, Saburo-san. It is a great relief to see you again. We feared for your health. It is wonderful that you seem so much better than we believed. I stammered in reply. I had failed to write Fujiko for many months. My apologies were halting and embarrassed. 
for Fujiko had written me often when I was at Lei, and the mail from home brought many gifts from her. Her father waved away my stammered apologies. It is of no matter, he said. We know of the marvellous things you have done at the front, and we are so proud of you. But now, tell us, how are your wounds? Will you be able to leave here soon? I was hit in four places, I answered. The doctors have done a wonderful job. Except, I added bitterly, pointing to my right eye. For this, I am blind in this eye, and the doctors say I will remain this way for the rest of my life. My reply startled Fujiko. She jerked her hand to her mouth, her eyes opening wide at what I had said. It's true. All of it, I emphasized. There are no two ways about it. I am disabled. The loss of this eye means the end to my life as a fighter pilot. Professor Niori interrupted. But then won't you be discharged from the Navy? No, no, I do not think so, I replied. The sarcasm welled up in me. You cannot understand this here at home, sir, but the magnitude of this war is beyond your comprehension. I do not think I will be discharged at all. The Navy will find use for me as an instructor, or I will be assigned to some command post duty on the ground. There was a brief silence. It gave me time to reflect that these two people had come more than 500 miles from their home in Tokushima, simply to welcome me home, to try and cheer me up. I was behaving disgracefully and I thanked them deeply for their trouble and their great kindness. Fujiko shook her head at me. She was obviously annoyed at the formality of my voice. She tried to speak, but the words did not come. Finally, she turned quickly to the elderly man at her side and cried, Father! Her eyes were wide and appealing. Professor Niori nodded gravely and cleared his throat. When do you think you will be reassigned? He asked. He looked straight at me. I think we will go ahead with the arrangements for the wedding. That is, of course, if it is all right with you, Saburo-san. What? What? I croaked. I could not believe his words. The wedding arrangements. My head reeled. I... I beg your pardon, sir? I blurted out. Forgive me, Saburo-san, he answered. I know this is a very clumsy way of bringing this matter before you. Let me say it otherwise. The old professor rose to his feet and spoke solemnly. Saburo-san, will you accept my daughter, Fujiko, as your bride? We have taken the utmost pains to raise her as a decent woman, and we have taught her to be exemplary in all the necessary and chosen fields. I would be exceedingly happy if you were to accept my offer, and I could be your father-in-law. I could do no more than gasp. His words were like bells ringing in heaven. Fujiko stared at my wide eyes and blushed. She lowered her head and looked into her lap. I tore my eyes away from her and stared at the wall. The irony was bitter. How many days had I stared in my despair at that same wall? Finally, I regained my voice, but I could hardly talk. My own words choked me. I had to force them out. I hated myself for what I was saying, but there was no way out. Professor Niori, I, sir, I am so greatly honored to hear your words. They are happiness itself, but I choked and forced back the tears. I, I cannot, I cannot accept your offer. There, it was done. The words were out. I had said it. What? His voice was incredulous. Are, uh, are you already engaged to someone else? No, oh no. Do not even think such a thing, I beg of you. I must decline, but for an entirely different reason. Professor Niori, I can't say yes. It is impossible. Look at me, sir. Look at me. I do not deserve Fujiko-san. Look at my eyes, I cried. I am half blind. Relief swept over his face. Oh, come, Saburo-san, you belittle yourself without need. Don't heap abuse upon yourself because you have been wounded. Your wounds are honorable. They bring no disgrace to you. Do you not understand your own position? All Japan acclaims you. They sing your praises. Do you not realize that as the greatest ace of our country, you are a national hero? Professor Niori, you do not understand. I am only telling you the truth, sir, the truth you yourself cannot see, I insisted. There is no condescension in my words. A hero is a fleeting thing. 
he is a creature of the moment. And I am not a hero. I am a flyer who cannot fly. I am a pilot who is half blind. What good am I? Of what use am I any longer? Hero indeed. You know our country has no individual heroes. He was silent for a while. Perhaps I express myself improperly, Saburasan, he continued. But you must realize that this is not a matter which has been decided upon suddenly. My wife and I took to you immediately upon our first meeting. I understand your feelings, but you must understand one thing above all. My wife and I, as well as Fujiko, believe you are the only man who can make her happy. It is our hope, our trust, that our daughter will do the same for you. I felt as though my heart would break. Could this fine and wonderful man not understand what I was driving at? How can you judge a man at only one meeting? I cried. How can you make this decision with so little to go on? Fujiko-san's entire life, her happiness, all hinges on the one time you have met me. I cannot understand your actions, although no honor ever offered me has been greater than that you brought to me tonight. I spread my arms in exasperation. There must be many other young men for Fujiko-san who are so much better suited than myself, thousands of them, with all the advantages of complete educations, with more promising futures. What can I offer your daughter, Professor Niori? What can I give her? I beg you again, look at me in another light. Look at me. What future do I have as I am now? Fujiko remained quiet no longer. She raised her head and stared at me. I wanted to run from the room. You are wrong, Saburo-san, she said quietly. Oh, you are so wrong. You make too much fuss over your eye. Whether you are half blind or not matters not at all to me. We are to be wedded as one. The same things in life which lie ahead for any man are yours too. If it be necessary, Saburo-san, if it be necessary, I can be of help. I do not want to marry you merely for the sake of your eyes. You are wrong, Fujiko-san, I replied. I know you are brave, that what you say about yourself is true. But now you are talking from sentiment. You cannot decide your entire life upon passing emotions. No, 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 she repeated, shaking her head. How can you so misunderstand me? This is no fleeting sentiment. Do you not realize that I have dwelt upon this meeting tonight for many months? I know what I am saying. There was no use in continuing the conversation in this fashion. I was afraid that at any moment I would break down. Professor Niori and Fujiko-san, I said with as much authority as I could inject into my voice. I am not trying to belittle you. This is not a matter for bargaining. I repeat, sir. You have bestowed upon me tonight the greatest honor I have ever known. But I cannot accept your magnificent offer. I refuse to allow my emotions to govern my thoughts or actions. I have always been a proud man. I cannot marry Fujiko-san. I cannot accept the honor of marrying this girl whom I do not deserve. That is the reason why I must say no. I will not do this to her. I refuse to listen to the professor's words. He pleaded with me, but I would only repeat the same words over and over again. Soon, Fujiko broke down. She flung herself into her father's arms and wept aloud. I could have killed myself for what I was doing, for the sorrow to which I was subjecting her. But I knew that I was acting properly, that what I was doing was for her good. A marriage with me might bring temporary happiness, but in later years, it would be Fujiko who would suffer. Nearly an hour later they left the room. I do not know how long I stared at the doorway after them. Then I turned and collapsed, weak and almost helpless, on the bed. That was the worst hour I had ever known. But what else could I have done? A thousand times I asked that question of myself. A thousand times the same answer came back to me. There wasn't any other way out of it, but this realization did me little good. I had cast aside the most beautiful thing which had ever entered my life. Two days later, Hatsuyo came for her weekly visit. She did not greet me with her usual smile and did not trouble to conceal her displeasure. How could you have done it, Saburo? she asked as soon as she was at my bedside. 
How could you have hurt Fujiko so much? Hatsuyo told me that Fujiko had sobbed uncontrollably when she visited Hatsuyo in Tokyo on her return from the hospital. Professor Niori begged my uncle and Hatsuyo to do everything in their power to make me change my mind. Hatsuyo looked eagerly at me. They say, Saburo, that perhaps you acted so because they displeased you with their words. My father and I know their family so well. They are such wonderful people. Why did you do it? She cried. <laughs> she rejected my words. They told us that you refused because you had been wounded. You should know better than to say that. It is only part of the reason. I have loved Fujiko with the deepest devotion ever since I first met her. My feelings for her are no less today. My love is no weaker. All through the long months at Lai and at Rabaul, Fujiko was to me woman eternal. Do you too fail to understand? I refused because I do love her. You are not making sense, Saburo. Listen to me then. During all the time I was overseas, during all the weary months in the Pacific, Fujiko never left my mind. I wanted her to be so proud of me, and I did well. Perhaps this is not the nicest thing to discuss with you, Hatsuyo, but I must be frank. Rabaul was a major military base, and there were more than 10,000 Japanese stationed there at all times. In addition, we often had with us for a while a full division of army troops. What do you think men do when they are away from home, away from their own women? Before my injury, I could have come to her as Sakai, the great ace, the fearless flyer, a man worthy of her hand. But now? No, I shouted at Hatsuyo. I will not be pitied. Do you think I could stand to have Fujiko? Pity me? Never. Now do you understand me? Hatsuyo held my hand tightly and nodded. I know, I know, she whispered. She looked into my eyes. I do know you, Saburo, much better than you realize. I know how badly you want to fly again, but I cannot help feeling sorry for Fujiko. She will be happier for it. She... But Hatsuyo interrupted me by throwing her arms around my neck and hugging me closely. Poor Saburo, have hope. You must have faith. You will fly again. I know you will. Chapter 24 In October, the Navy transferred me to the Sasebo Navy Hospital. The change of surroundings was more than welcome. I would be closer to home and could see my family again. By now, the torrid summer was gone and the train ride proved comfortable. I opened the windows wide and soaked in sunshine and the soothing autumn wind. Japan was as beautiful as ever, and now, with autumn color on the mountains and hills, the passing countryside took on the appearance of a strange and wonderful fairyland. Trees and shrubs lay in crimson splashes on both sides of the tracks. They had turned yellow and scarlet and green and brown in a riot of blending hues. Three hours after we left Yokosuka, Fujiyama swam into view. I will never tire of looking at this most beautiful of all mountains. The graceful lines curved gently to the summit, still uncapped with snow, but half hidden in swirling mist, made brilliant by the sun. Fujisan. It reminded me of Fujiko, who was, indeed, named after the mountain, but who was now equally as remote for me. The country lay quietly, at peace. There was no war here, not within the hundreds of farms and paddies which lay neat, clean and prosperous on both sides of the tracks. What war? I saw only what I had always seen, now even more beautiful than when I had viewed it as a younger man. My perspective was different. Now I could compare the serenity and dignity of all this with the volcanic misery which was Rabaul, the sandy runway gouged out of the jungle at Lay. No wonder an aura of comfort and well-being radiated from my home soil. And yet, I mused, not one of these people, the children, the farmers, young and old, the village elders, the postmen and the police, the merchants, not one of them had crossed Guadalcanal from 20,000 feet and looked down to see the vast ocean alive, teeming with a strange and terrible life, row upon row of American warships and transports, 
and there were so many more lying over the horizon I had not seen. In this respect, too, my perspective had changed. Our pilots from the Lai Wing were unique, I had discovered at Rabal. The incredible one-sided margin of victories was by no means shared by other wings. And the army, what of the army? With its pilots who sadly lacked the fine temper of training which we had been afforded, whose planes blundered into enemy entrapments. My mother waited to greet the train at the Fukuoka station. We stopped only briefly, and no through passengers were permitted off the train. I leaned as far out of my window as I could, waving frantically to catch her attention. The joy in her face when she saw me was the most wonderful thing I had known in so many long months. She was older, oh, so much older, now that all her sons had left for war. I shouted to her. I am all right now, I cried. I am all right, mother. Don't worry about me. Everything is all right now. The train was moving again. She stood on the platform, her eyes brimming with tears, slowly waving the rising sun flag, crying, Banzai, Banzai, after me, as the train pulled away. The doctors at Sasebo ordered another month's convalescence in the hospital. No longer did I argue with them or implore them to return me to Rabul. I felt drained out. I cared little about what their orders might be. The month passed slowly, but my first weekend was gladdened by a visit from my mother. She was still the same wonderful woman, convinced that what I needed best were the favorite foods of my childhood. She had cooked an entire meal to bring along with her. I feared the moment when I would have to tell her of losing the sight of my right eye. To my astonishment, she did not appear upset at the news. It does not make you any less a man, my son, she said calmly, and that closed the subject for her. She offered to come every weekend. It would have been wonderful to see her so often, but I begged her not to. She was old and no longer could stand the arduous rail journey. Train travel was becoming more and more difficult. With war material taking up so much space, passenger accommodations were restricted and at best were acutely uncomfortable. In November, there occurred an event which, under any other circumstances, would have been one of the greatest moments in my life. Now, it meant little. Orders were received by the hospital, promoting me to the rank of warrant officer. The long climb upward from a recruit seaman, with its brutal discipline and endless punishment, was ended. Step by step, I had forged my way through the ranks, and now the reward had come. It was a hollow victory, but it had its compensations. My new status meant I could complete my convalescence at home. I snatched at the surgeon's offer and left at once for the Fukuoka suburbs, where I joined my family. The next month was wonderful. It was the first time in ten years I had spent thirty consecutive days with my mother, and her happiness was a joy to behold. Everything was quiet and peaceful. Almost every day my mother asked, When do you think the war will be over, Saburo? I knew she had in mind my two brothers, who were now overseas and every time she asked, I could only tell her the truth. I did not know. Then she would look around, to be sure no other person was within earshot. Saburo, tell me, she implored in a half-whisper. Are we really winning? Is everything they tell us true? Again I could only repeat, we must win. But she was happy. There was no denying that. I knew that she wished there was some way my convalescence period could be made to continue indefinitely. Several weeks after I arrived at my sister's home, I had a visitor from Tokyo, a news correspondent sent by the Yomiuri Shimbun, one of the largest newspapers in Japan. He told me his paper had sent him down from Tokyo to get an exclusive interview with Japan's leading ace. I wondered how many enemy planes Nishizawa and Ota had shot down by now. I was sure they had surpassed my own victories. The entire country wanted to read my own words on the war. I questioned my liberty to talk to this man. Disciplinary action could be swift and harsh if I spoke out of turn. I called the administration officer at Sasebo and told him my problem. He was evasive and insisted there were no specific regulations in the matter. I have no authority to discourage you from talking with a reporter, he concluded. 
but I must remind you that your conversation will be entirely at your own discretion, and that you may be held responsible for anything you say. Also, bear in mind that this desk neither approves nor disapproves of any officer giving an interview. Just be careful. That was certainly a negative reply. I returned to my room and told the correspondent that my superiors did not favour the interview he requested, but he would not be shaken so easily. It is not that I meant to bother you, he pleaded, but that I have travelled 700 miles from Tokyo just to talk to you. Let me ask you only a few questions, please. Just five minutes will do. Fool that I was, I should have known better. His ability to twist and weave through a conversation was uncanny. His five minutes became three days. Every morning he commuted to my home from his hotel and took many notes. Never have I encountered such tact. He made me talk almost about everything. His questions kept away from the war, until I discovered that the stories of my personal accounts were of the war. He soon found out that I had lost all optimism, and that our Navy flyers at Rabaul, despite their many successes, were now waging an uphill battle at Guadalcanal, and virtually without any cooperation from the fighters and bombers of the Japanese army. We need more fighters and more experienced pilots, I told him in a fit of anger. Every Zero fighter should be pulled off the line and run through a complete overhaul after 150 hours in the air. This has nothing to do with battle damage. Even if the airplane never fires a shot and is never fired at in return, it requires that overhaul. Now, we can't do that anymore. We consider a Zero in excellent condition if it is only slightly shot up and has a complete overhaul after 200 hours. Do you know what it means for a pilot to go into combat with an airplane that won't answer every demand at the controls? Only the best of our flyers can take that kind of a ship into battle and come out alive. If the new pilots we're sending overseas as replacements don't measure up to the standards of the men with whom I flew, then heaven help them. The American Navy pilots we encountered over Guadalcanal were the best I have ever fought, and their tactics were superb, and their planes are certain to improve. The reporter was more than satisfied. He could not conceal his elation as he thanked me profusely and bid me goodbye. I was to find out later, however, that I had committed a major error even in talking to him at all. A week later, I returned to the Sasebo Hospital and filed a request for a final medical checkup, which would qualify me for reassignment. It was accepted. They assigned me to a cot in the hospital and told me I would remain for several days until they could complete the examination. Early the next morning, I was summoned to the administration office at Sasebo headquarters. The roof had caved in. The personnel captain's face was red from his anger. Warrant Officer Sakai, he shouted. You are an idiot. I just received a wire from Navy military headquarters in Tokyo, telling me that they have suppressed in its entirety the interview you gave that reporter from the Yomiuri Shimbun. Have you taken leave of your senses, saying the things you did? Now you listen to me, Sakai. Tokyo has reprimanded me sharply for my lack of surveillance over the men under my command. I will not stand for this kind of stupidity. I tell you now that you will release not one single word about your combat duty without first clearing with the public information officer. Do you understand? Any repetition of the nonsense which you just issued will result not only in your court-martial, but mine as well. And no one, no one, you understand, is going to do that to me. I understood perfectly. I was to be gagged, but I could sympathise with my superior's position. It was all very simple, Sakai. Just keep your mouth shut. I returned to the hospital, brooding at the tongue lashing I had just received. Someone called my name. An orderly stood stiffly at attention in the doorway, saluting. What is it? I snapped. You have a visitor, sir? A tall naval flyer is waiting for you in the visitor's room. I think he said his name is Nishizawa. What? I shouted. Nishizawa! Can it really be he? I forgot everything that had happened and dashed madly from the room nearly knocking the startled orderly off his feet. I opened the door to the visitor's room and stared in. A tall, lean man paced slowly in the room, a cigarette in his mouth. It was. He hadn't changed a bit. 
he looked up at me, smiling broadly, and shouted, Sakai! I yelled his name. Nishizawa! The next second we were pounding each other on the back, happy beyond all words. I held my good friend at arm's length. Let me look at you, I cried. You look wonderful. No wounds? I asked hastily. None, Saburo, came the welcome answer. I left Rabaul in November. Not a scratch on me. It seems that all those bullets just never caught up. I was elated. Ha! We named you properly, all right, I said. Truly, you are our own devil, my friend, to have come through Lei and Rabal without a mark on you. Nishizawa, it is simply wonderful to see you again. Tell me, how did things go after I left? By now you must be the Navy's leading pilot. Oh, I can just imagine you over Guadalcanal. He waved his hands in protest. You make too much of me, Saburo, he complained. I am not even sure of the exact figure. Maybe, around fifty or so but I am still far behind you. He smiled. Perhaps you do not realize it, but you are still the best of all our pilots. Ah, you talk like a fool, old friend, I said. I have seen you fly too many times. I am afraid, Nishizawa, that you shall be our leading ace before too long. But tell me, what are you doing at Sasebo? They sent me home to the Yokosuka wing, he answered, his face turning glum. An instructor. That's what they made me. An instructor. Saburo, can you picture me running around in a rickety old biplane, teaching some fool youngster how to bank and turn, and how to keep his pants dry? Me! I laughed. He was right. Nishizawa just wasn't the instructor type. Well, he continued, after a little time at that, I felt disgusted. So I volunteered to go overseas again, just as soon as they would let me. I received my orders this morning. I'm reassigned to the Philippines. That's why I had to see you today. We take off tomorrow morning. So soon? It is the way I wish it to be, Saburo, he replied. Flying around Yokosuka is not for me. I want a fighter under my hands again. I simply have to get back into action. Staying home in Japan is killing me. I knew how he felt. Indeed, I knew too well but there were other things to discuss, our other friends. I envy you, Nishizawa. But come, tell me about Rabol. Let me hear about everyone else. Where is Lieutenant Sasai now? And Ota, is he with you? What about my wingmen, Yonakawa and Hatori? Tell me all about them. What? He stared at me, his face blank. Despair crowded his eyes. So they did not tell you? What are you talking about? He waved his hand feebly. What is the matter with you, Nishizawa? Weren't they sent home with you? He turned away, his back to me. His voice choked. Saburo, they are... He put a hand to his forehead. Then he spun around. Dead! I couldn't believe it. It was impossible. What are you saying? I yelled at him. They are all dead. You and I, Saburo, you and I, we are the only ones still alive. It couldn't be true. My knees buckled. I leaned against a table while my mind tried to comprehend this tragedy. Nishizawa began to talk. Lieutenant Sasai was the first. We made a sweep to Guadalcanal on August 26. It was not as you remember, Saburo. I don't know how many wildcats there were, but they seemed to come out of the sun in an endless stream. We never had a chance. Our formation went to pieces. We had to scatter so quickly that no one saw Sasai's plane go down. We thought that perhaps he had been hurt and had gone ahead of us, but when we returned to Rabaul, he was missing. He never came back. Nishizawa sighed wearily. Then it was Ota. Just one week later. Every time we went out, we lost more and more planes. Guadalcanal was completely under the enemy's control. Ota went the same way as Sasai. No one saw his plane go down. He just didn't come home. Then, about three or four days after that, Yonakawa and Hatori were shot down. Both of them died the same day. Of all the men who returned with me, only Captain Saito, Commander Nakajima, 
and less than six of the other pilots who were in our original group of 80 men survived. I was stunned. Nishizawa remained silent, waiting for me to speak again. It seemed so unreal. How could they all be dead? Four of my best friends. They were all killed while I lay helplessly in the Yokosuka hospital. Now I understood why I had failed to learn of their loss before. Nishizawa and Nakajima had made sure that the news did not reach me. Not when the operation on my eyes had just been performed. Their faces swam before me. I remembered Ota, laughing from his cockpit as we looped over Moresby. Yonakawa and Hatori, who clung grimly to my tail through all the air battles, always alert to protect me, to keep me from being killed. Sasai, he... And now they were... dead. I sobbed aloud, without shame, like a child. I could not stop. My body shook helplessly. Nishizawa grasped my hand, begging me to stop. Saburo, please, he implored. Please stop it. I looked up at him. I am an accursed man, he choked at me. I never saw Sasai and Ota going down. I never even knew they had been lost. Our best friends, Saburo, our best friends and I didn't do anything to help them. I must be Satan's bastard, he raged going after other planes while they died around me. He sat down again. No, no, it is not true. There was nothing I could do. There were just too many enemy planes, just too many. His voice trailed off. We sat silently for a long time, looking at each other. What more was there to say? Chapter 25 I was discharged from Sasebo Hospital during the last week of January 1943. The long months of medical attention were over. I reported to my original outfit, the Tainan Fighter Wing of the 11th Air Fleet, now stationed at Toyohashi in central Japan. I had first joined the wing during its formation in September of 1941 at Tainan on Formosa. Of the 150 pilots who had left Tainan during the Great Japanese Sweep across the Pacific, less than 20 were now alive. These veterans formed the core of the new wing the majority of the members of which were green pilots rushed through training schools at Tsuchura and other air bases. Commander Tadashi Nakajima personally greeted me when I arrived at Toyohashi. Neither he nor I ever thought that we would meet here instead of back at Rabaul. Thank heaven that Nakajima was my superior officer again. He engaged in no nonsense about my not being able to fly, and the very next day I went aloft. Only in a flying fortress. This was the same B-17 which the army had captured at Bandung, Java in March of 1942. Every man of my original outfit went up in the great bomber. We got a tremendous kick out of flying the bomber, which impressed us with its excellent controllability and, above all, the precision workmanship of its equipment. No large Japanese airplane I had ever seen was in its class. The next day I returned to my first love, the Zero. I can never describe the wonder of the feelings which came back to me as I took the lithe fighter into the air. She handled like a dream. Just a flick of the wrist, she was gone. I went through all sorts of aerobatics, standing the zero on her tail, diving, sliding off on the wings. I was drunk with the air again. As an officer, I acquired an entirely new perspective of the war. Enlisted men were denied access to the secret combat reports which the Navy distributed to its officer personnel. Several days after my arrival at Toyohashi, Nakajima wordlessly showed me the report of our withdrawal from Guadalcanal on February 7th, 1943, exactly six months after the Americans had landed. The radios blared of strategic withdrawals, of tightening our defence lines, but the secret reports revealed a staggering defeat and appalling losses. Two full divisions of army troops were gone, annihilated by the savagely fighting enemy. The Navy had lost the equivalent of an entire peacetime fleet. Rusting in the mud off Guadalcanal were the blasted hulks of no less than two battleships, one aircraft carrier, five cruisers, twelve destroyers, eight submarines, hundreds upon hundreds of fighters and bombers, not to mention the crack fighter pilots and all the bomber crews. What had happened to us? We had stormed through the Pacific with impunity. Time and again we had whipped the enemy fighter planes, but the secret reports from the front 
told of new enemy fighters far superior to the P-39s and P-40s. And for the first time, I learned what really had happened at Midway last June. Four carriers, and nearly 300 airplanes with most of their pilots, lost. It was unbelievable. My heart sank when I saw the new pilot arrivals assigned to the Tainan wing. They were eager and serious young men, unquestionably brave. But determination and courage were no substitute for pilot skill, and these men lacked the fine temper which they would need against the Americans who stormed the Pacific in ever-increasing numbers. These recruits with their shining faces, were they to fill the yawning gulf left by such men as Sasai and Ota? How? How in the name of heaven could they be expected to do that? Their training at Toyohashi was severe. From sunup to sundown, the instructors ran them through their paces, classroom studies, and more and more flying. Teach them to hold their formations. That's a control stick you're holding there, not a broom handle. Don't just fly your airplane, become a part of it. This is how you save fuel. Squeeze your trigger for short bursts. Don't burn out your guns. All the lessons of the past battles relived again, trying to implant the invaluable lessons, the little tricks, the advantages in these new men. But we didn't have enough time. We couldn't watch for individual errors and take the long hours necessary to weed the faults out of a trainee. Hardly a day passed when fire engines and ambulances did not race down the runways, sirens shrieking to dig one or more pilots out of the plane. They had wrecked on a clumsy takeoff or landing. Not all the new pilots were so ill-equipped to master the training planes and fighters. Many appeared as gifted in the air as the great aces in 1939 and 1940 had been. But their numbers were distressingly few, and there would be no painless interval for them to gain many hours in the air or any combat experience before they were thrown against the Americans. Less than a month after Guadalcanal fell, we were called in for a special officers' conference to hear news of a further disaster. The report remained classified throughout the rest of the war and was never revealed to the Japanese public. Behind locked doors, I read that a Japanese convoy of more than 20 ships, 12 transports, 8 destroyers, and several smaller auxiliaries had attempted to land army troops at Ley, my old fighter airbase. At least 100 enemy fighters and bombers attacked the convoy on the open seas with determined runs, sinking all the transports and at least five of the destroyers. The news carried implications of a disaster greater than Guadalcanal, for it meant that the enemy now dominated the skies as far north as Ley, and that we were helpless to stop his incredibly effective attacks against our shipping. Several days later, the Tainan Air Wing was ordered to transfer without delay to Rabul. Commander Nakajima asked me if I would accompany him back to the Southwest Pacific. How could he believe I wished to do otherwise? Nakajima told me that, despite the loss of my right eye, he was convinced I was better than the new pilots. That night, headquarters posted a list of the men who were transferring to Rabal. My name was included, but we failed to reckon with the chief surgeon at Toyohashi. He was outraged when he read my name on the list. He stormed into Nakajima's office and vented his wrath on the unhappy commander. You are out of your mind, he bellowed. Do you want to kill this man? What is wrong with you even to consider allowing a one-eyed pilot to go into combat? He wouldn't stand a chance. The whole thing is preposterous. I will not allow Sakai to transfer to Rabul. We could hear them shouting at the other side of the field. Nakajima protested that I was better than most of the new flyers, that, two eyes or one, Nothing could replace my skill behind the controls of a zero nor, for that matter, my long combat experience. The surgeon refused to budge an inch. Now Nakajima became angry. They argued back and forth for several hours, but in the end, it was the surgeon who emerged triumphant. He persuaded Nakajima to change his mind. As he left the commander's office, I ran up to him and begged him to change his mind. He stared unbelievingly at me. He tried to speak but his face turned redder and redder until he yelled, Shut up! at me and stalked off, muttering that all flyers were crazy. I was reassigned as a flight instructor to the Amura Air Base near Sasebo. The new wing arrived at Rabaul on April 3rd. Before a week passed, I read in the battlefront reports they had carried out major attacks against Guadalcanal, 
Milne Bay, Port Darwin, and other critical targets. In four missions, enemy fighters and anti-aircraft guns shot no less than 49 of the wing's planes out of the air. Disaster followed disaster.